Hello. Hi, Linda. Hey, hey, Linda. Hi, we're Linda. getting ready to get serenaded. <laughs> Stephen says, sounds awesome. <laughs> awesome song. <laughs> Bonnie, that reminded me of your whatever it would be where you said that he called my name. I'm still working on that. <laughs> but it reminded me of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hello, Linda. Hey, how are you? Fine. We, as Hello. you can tell, we've been joined by the Hannah House ladies. All right, y'all ready to get started? Mm -hmm. All right. So tonight we're talking about the Lord's Prayer, um, and because I'm going to be on vacation next week, um, we're going to rearrange this a little bit, and we're going to do the introduction to the Lord's Prayer and the first three petitions tonight, and then we'll be off next week, and then the following week we'll do the last four petitions of the Lord's Prayer. So before we get into that, um, how's everybody doing? How doing? Um, any comments from last week that we didn't get to that have sprung up in your mind? Why are you looking at me when you say that? <laughs> I'm looking at the computer. The fact that oh. you happen to be on the computer is is just a coincidence, I guess. I'm in, I'm, a, I'm in that corner that you're looking at up there. <laughs> All right. So if I don't hear any, I'm gonna go on. Good, good, good. Where is it? Can you hand me a Bible, please? Sorry. You're not prepared. 
I'm always prepared. <laughs> See, I have a whole piece of paper that says I'm prepared. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, it's a bit fancy. I wrote it up in the office this afternoon. I like Stephen, just like a Boy Scout. <laughs> always prepared. <laughs> All right, so who can tell me where the Lord's Prayer comes from? Matthew and okay. Luke. And Luke. So in Matthew, it's in Matthew chapter 6, um, verses 9 through 13. So I'm going to read that if you want to turn to that. So Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13. What version are you reading? I'm reading out of the ESV because that's the version that Rosie handed me. <laughs> okay. All right. So verse 9, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our, our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. All right. And then in Luke, it's Luke 11, verses 2 through 4. So starting at verse 2, and Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. So obviously there's differences between those two, right? There's, uh, Matthew includes a little bit more than Luke does. And none of them include the, the last part that we always add to it, which is, um, for thine is the power and the, the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So without getting too deep into it, there's, there's a way of interpreting the Bible called source criticism. And they try to figure out where the writers of the Gospels got their material. The idea is that Luke and Matthew shared material, but they got it from a different source. So that would account for the differences in it. Either way, the biblical witness is clear that Jesus said this. So, you know, this is a legitimate Jesus saying, when you pray, pray like this. And then as we get into the, to the actual petitions, you'll see why Jesus says to do that because of the way the prayer is broken down. So the first three petitions, which is the first petition is hallowed be your name. Second is your kingdom come. The third is your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Those are the three petitions that cover God. Okay. So we always, when we pray, we always start out with God, right? You always address your prayers to God and God is always the primary actor. So the first three petitions cover God. The last four focus on human need. So tonight we're going to do the God petitions, and then two weeks from now we'll do the, the human need petitions. I mentioned a second ago about the last piece, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Does anybody know what that's called? Ology. Say again, Bonnie? The doxology. Yes. So the doxology. Now, a lot of us know the doxology is praise God from whom all blessings flow. Um, but a doxology in general is just a blessing at the end of something or a petition of praise at the end of something. Um, so this is added really early in the church, but probably not while Jesus was still alive. There's a, a first century writing called the Didache, which is Greek for teachings of the apostles. Um, and it, it talks about it, it has the doxology appended to the end of the Lord's Prayer. Most Protestant churches, Lutheran, Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, the, you know, non-Catholic churches, typically include that every time they say the Lord's Prayer. Um, the Catholic Church does when they are having communion. 
um, they'll add it to the end after another little piece that they add in. The Eastern Orthodox, it kind of depends. And you know, there are some traditions that use what they want to use and you, you never know what you're going to get. So everybody worships in their own way, right? All right. So are there any questions about that brief little introduction? The, the, the base, yes, Linda. Tell me again what version you're using. What do you mean? What version, what version of the Bible you're using? So what I was reading a minute ago was the ESV, okay. which is the English Standard Version. But that was, yeah, that was, okay. Um, so the, the main point of this is that Jesus said this, this is how Jesus says we should pray. So this is the way we pray. That's why it's in our worship service. Um, it's actually in all our worship services, which is, it's actually the only prayer that we include in every piece of our liturgy. So, it even appears in the Good Friday liturgy. Um, so let's talk about the, the introduction piece. Because Luther likes to break things up. You've noticed that by now. Okay. So Luther says the introduction to the Lord's Prayer is just those two words, Our Father. And it covers who we're addressing, God, and it covers our relationship. God is our father. God created us all. God has a parental care for all of us and wants us to be healthy and happy and wholesome and, and the whole nine yards, right? This is stuff we've talked about in the, the commandments and in the creed. You know, God is creator, has a creator's care for us, but also a personal relationship with us as well. Um, so it's supposed to be that introduction is supposed to be a reminder that God loves us, God cares about us, and God wants to hear from us. You know, it's not just, you're not just praying to thin air. You know, when you say our father, you caught God's attention. God is now listening. And the, the prayer that you're going to utter is going to be answered. It's not going to be answered necessarily in the way you expect it to be. But it will be answered somehow, and you will be a part of that answer because God is going to invite you in to whatever the answer is. Does that make sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's the introduction. Real easy, right? Mm -hmm. The first petition gets a little bit more. So the first petition is, hallowed be your name. So what does hallowed mean? Holy. So if you hallow something, or yeah, Stephen, you're right too, great. It's something that's that's set apart. Okay, so we're saying, you know, our Father, holy be your name. And that's more than just a statement, because we already know that God's name is holy. Okay, we don't, we don't need to really say that, because God has told us that much. God told us that in the commandments, where God said, do not use the Lord's name in vain. Um, this is more than just a statement of fact. This is a request. Holy be your name. Help us keep your name holy. So if we're asking God to help us keep God's name holy, who's the one who's messing it up? It's probably us, right? All right. And we do this in a variety of ways. So, you know, God's name is marked on us. In the Lutheran tradition, God's name is marked on us in our baptism. In other traditions, it's, it's a little different because some traditions don't do baptism as when you're kids. Okay. But in the Lutheran tradition, God's name is upon you at the moment of your baptism. God marks you as, your, as God's own and you are part of God. Okay. So anything you do in your life reflects back on God because God has named you and claimed you. So when we pray, holy be your name, hallowed be your name, we're asking God to help us stop doing the bad things that embarrass God. Okay. You know, and that's, that can be a variety of categories that can be teaching people something that's wrong, you know, whether it's Bible or whatever else it may be. It can be using the Lord's name in vain or, or trying to use God's name to cover up our own shame. Um, 
it can be just leading in a generally evil life. You know, if you're just out there to hurt people, you know, you're probably not making God very proud, are you? It can be a matter of breaking commandments. You know, we, we've talked about all the variety of ways you can break commandments without even meaning to. And most of them come down to being cruel to your neighbors. You know, doing things like that reflects back on God because God has named you. It's just like, you know, that's one of the reasons parents who are, who are worth being parents get upset when their kid misbehaves. Because not only is it distracting the kid from what they're supposed to be doing, but other people were looking at the parents like, what are you doing? Why, why is your kid acting like this? You know, I didn't want to get called into a parent teacher conference in the first week of school, but my daughter decided that that was going to be a necessity this year. No. Yeah. Yeah. You weren't here for that part. She's <laughs> taken to, she's, she's in kindergarten and she's taken to go into the bathroom and never coming back. <laughs> We all feel like that sometimes. <laughs> we yeah, just want well, to go and never early. come back. It's start early. So, y'all pray for me because I'm going to need it, obviously. Um, yeah. But, we, I mean, you know, when she messes up, when she does things like that, it reflects back on us as much as it does her because, you know, the teacher's going to want to know, why is your kid wandering off? Why does she think she's part of part door of the Explorer and going all around the school, you know, why is she so bad at hiding and getting caught? I don't know. I wish, I wish she, you know, fix that. But I mean, if she was going to be like me, I didn't get caught. That was the difference. <laughs> what did you do? In the oh my. Do what? What did you do at kindergarten? Yeah. So you can ask my mother. I was bad from beginning to end. Like I, I told y'all that story in the sermon one day. I was I was being honest. I was in the assistant principal's office so many times when I was in high school that he and my parents became friends. They used to go to dinner. <laughs> uh huh. So turns out you can turn out all right. It just took a while. Must be an assistant principal friend in your future. Yeah. It wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> so the really bad part is this is the Catholic school she's at and she's messing up there. So, mm. you know, I was hoping there'd be nuns with rulers that would cut that out pretty quick. Oh, look. Do they still do that? <laughs> Speak of her and she shall appear. Our favorite miscreant. <laughs> yeah. Come out here looking all cute right now. <laughs> All right. So questions about the first petition. So basically, God's name is holy, and we ask God to help us keep it holy by not doing things that we shouldn't that reflect poorly on God. That's, that's the long and the short of that. All right. So let's go to the second petition which is, again, very short. Your kingdom come. What do you think we're praying for when we ask God to bring God's kingdom? We're asking to be a prophet. Yeah. I couldn't hear. He broke up. What did he say? Couldn't either. Can you repeat that, John? I said that we're asking to be a part of it when it does come. Yeah. Okay. So there's an idea in theology called the already not yet. Okay. Um, the, the clearest sign of the already not yet is when you talk about salvation. Okay. Jesus has already come and died on a cross and, laid in the grave for three days and then been raised by God and ascended into heaven. And because that has already happened, we know that we are saved when we believe in Jesus. Okay. So there's your already. The not yet part is that even though we know we're saved, we're still having to work through this life with all of its troubles and all the problems that we cause ourselves and that other people cause us. And so even though we know we're saved, we're not there yet. Okay. 
this is the same thing when we pray about God's kingdom coming. Okay, we're talking about the already not yet in that. We know that one day God's kingdom will come. It will be here on earth. The earth will be renewed and the judgment will happen and the, you know, you, people will go to heaven, but heaven will actually be on earth if you read Revelation. So everything's going to change, right? That's the not yet. The already part is that we know what God's kingdom is going to look like. We know that it's going to be a place where everybody is following the commandments. We know it's going to be a place where everybody shows love for their neighbors and for each other and for themselves. We know it's going to be a place where we're in a relationship with God that is closer than any we can think of. Okay. So when we pray for God's kingdom to come, we're not just asking for that kingdom to come one day. We're asking for that kingdom to come now, too, to help us start living that way right now, because there's no point waiting. We don't have to wait for God to renew the world to start loving one another. We don't have to wait for God to renew the world to start caring for others and to be the people that God calls us to be. We just need to do it. And it's hard because sin is a lot more fun than following rules and being nice to people that you might not actually like. But if you actually can manage to do that through the temptation of sin, then the world becomes a better place. And that kingdom does start to happen right here in the here and now. So when we ask God to bring God's kingdom, we're asking that all of the ways of God may happen here. That all of that love, all of that, caring all of that support and desire for our health and for us to beat whatever is dragging us down, that all of that happens now and in the future. We also ask that we're able to grow in the faith that we already have and that because we grow in the faith and we demonstrate that faith, that others might come to faith because of the example of us. Because let's face it, if all we do is sit in our churches on Sunday morning and talk about how good we are and how evil the rest of the world is, and then we go out from the churches and spend Monday through Saturday doing whatever we want to do, living in all kind of craziness, then there's not a whole lot of people who are going to be like, you know what? I want to be a part of that. You know, we have to live as an example. You can't teach one thing and then go do something else. That's not the way it works. That's called hypocrisy. So basically this boils down to us asking God to make things right in the world, both now and in the future. That is a big ask. Okay. You're essentially asking God to wipe away all the evils of the world and give us the kingdom. And if it was just us asking that, I mean, can you imagine just us, you know, even just one or two of us, fairly insignificant mortals going to the eternal divine being that is God and saying, hey, give us everything you got. That would be crazy. But God has told us to ask for this. Even though it doesn't make sense to us, God has told us this is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to ask for the kingdom. We're supposed to ask for God's glory to be among us, even if we don't always know what to do with that. You know? Are y'all following me so far? We good? Do you have questions yet? Linda, do you have questions yet? <laughs> Why is he pointing yeah. to Linda? This, this is pretty straightforward tonight. <laughs> okay. So, we've gotten to this point. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. So now we're growing up on the third petition. The third petition is, your will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. So we've already asked for the kingdom to come. Why do we need to ask for God's will to be done? As chances are the kingdom is not coming today. Depends on how nice you are today. Chances are the kingdom is not coming today. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so just as we have need in society for somebody to be in charge, whoever that person is, we're not getting into that tonight. Just as we have need for somebody to, to provide rules and regulations to keep society in line, we also have need for defense. So be it police or military or whatever it is, you have need for defense. The same is true in our faith. Left to our own devices, we are essentially open targets for evil, for sin, for the devil, however you want to characterize it, okay? It's really easy for that to sneak into our lives because the flesh is weak. It's just reality of things. Like I said before, sin is more fun. And that's not me advertising for you to go out and sin. That's just calling a fact. So we can't do this on our own. There's no way we can do it by ourselves. This is the whole reason Jesus comes in the first place. If we could fix all this by ourselves and be holy unto ourselves, there'd have been no reason for Jesus to come and suffer and die. But we can't. So this is a direct attack from the devil. The devil sees us trying to make these things right. The devil hears us asking God to bring these things into our life. And it becomes a direct attack on us. We're going to start upsetting people. We're going to start getting people out of whack because they don't want the status quo to change. They don't want the the relaxation they found in sin to be stripped from them. Um, we're going to be attacked. People are going to go after us because they don't like the fact that we're trying to change things or that we're trying to bring the kingdom. So we're asking God's justice to be with us. Thy will be done. And not just that, not just justice, but that whatever God wants to happen, happens. We're asking God to help us be okay with the fact that we're not in control, that we can't decide how the world's going to work or who's going to do what. We can't control our neighbors. At times, we can barely control ourselves. So we're asking God to help us with that and to help us be okay with the fact that we are subject to God's will, that God cares for us and wants the best for us, and that we will get there, we just have to try to take the hands off from time to time and let God do the leading. Because when we try to do it on our own, we inevitably mess up. Does that make sense? You track it with me? Okay. So Luther talks about um, different things that can be taken from us as we try to bring the kingdom and ask God's will to be done. The things the devil will go after us for. So possessions, honor, house, farm, depending on where you live, spouse and children, body and life. Does any of that sound familiar? No. Well, Job, yes. But it's also essentially verse four of a mighty fortress is our God. So verse four of a mighty fortress is... God's word forever shall abide, no thanks to foes who fear it. For God himself fights by our side with weapons of the spirit. Were they to take our house, goods, honor, child, or spouse, though life be wrenched away, they cannot win the day. The kingdom's ours forever. So when Luther wrote the words to that hymn back in, what, 1530-ish, Bonnie? Luther wrote this hymn. Yeah, Luther wrote A Mighty Fortress. Luther, Luther wrote several hymns in our hymnal. Um, a Mighty Fortress, 
Uh, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Um, there's a few Advent hymns, stuff like that. He didn't write the tune. This was a popular bar tune at the time, which he got criticized for. But if you want a song to stick in somebody's head and they're already singing the bar tune, just change the words and suddenly they're singing hymns. So, you know, that was actually kind of smart. Of course, there are some songs out there today that I don't suggest you try that with, but yeah. Um, so in the large catechism, which is the thing that explains what we're talking about, um, Luther writes this, and I don't usually quote him, but bear with me. So such prayer must be our protection and defense now to repulse and vanquish all that the devil bishops, remember he had a tiff with the Catholic Church, <laughs> tyrants and heretics can do against our gospel. Let them all rage and try their worst. Let them plot and plan how to suppress and eliminate us so that their will and scheme may prevail. Against them, a simple Christian or two, armed with this single petition, shall be our bulwark, against which they shall dash themselves to pieces. We have this comfort and boast, that the will and purpose of the devil and all our enemies shall and must fail and come to naught, no matter how proud, secure, and powerful they think they are. For if their will were not broken and frustrated, the kingdom of God would, could not abide on earth, nor his name be hallowed. So Luther's basically saying, it's fine. Let the world get mad at you. Okay, let people get angry. Let people say you're not right. Let people talk crap about you. It doesn't matter. At the end, of the, day, yeah, <laughs> at the end of the day, God's will will be done. And there's not a word they can say or thing they can do or anything they can think of that's going to stop that. Because this world don't belong to anybody but God. Doesn't matter. And that's very comforting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason that Lexi says the Lord's Prayer every night before we go to bed. You know, it's... You know, it helps that Jesus told us this is the right prayer. But, you know, it's essentially the perfect prayer. You know, we address our needs with God, and God addresses our human needs. What I talked before is about the translation from the Greek. Mm -hmm. um, which version of the Bible which version of the Lord's Prayer in the versions of the Bible most closely follows the Greek? Because if this is the perfect prayer, we've seen fit to change it about 20 times. Yeah, well, there's that. Um, most of it is pretty straightforward. You'll find most of the translations are pretty close. Um, even if you look in our hymnal, so... The traditional version of the Lord's Prayer, which is based on the King James translation from the 1600s, is um, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but for, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. That's pretty far from the ESV. Yeah, well, that's because we've we've added to it over the years, and the ESV. So the ESV does a little interesting stuff with translation sometimes. Um, if you listen to the other option in the hymnal, which is the Ecumenical Common English Translation, not that you'll be able to find that anywhere. Um, it's our Father who, oh, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. So it adds a doxology like we talked about before. But it also unites the, the Lucan version and the Matthean version together to make one prayer. Um, which scholars justify that by saying that, you know, 
Matthew was written a little bit later than Luke, so it's possible that that the Lucan version was something Jesus said at the beginning of his ministry, and the Matthean version was something that was said at the end, and they were written down at different times. Um, but that's more complicated than we really need to be. So, like, Jesus couldn't remember the perfect prayer? No, more like people who wrote it down probably didn't catch it all. Remember that there wasn't anybody like following Jesus around with a quill and a scroll and like writing down everything he said. You know, most of this stuff gets passed down by tradition and it's divinely inspired. So we believe that what's in the Bible is supposed to be there, but there's going to be some differences between the gospels. That's why we included all four. So, The other thing with the Greek, there's one word in the Greek, the, what we translate as daily bread. It's actually almost untranslatable because it doesn't appear very often in Greek, either in, in regular Koine Greek or in biblical Greek. Um, the closest we can come to it is giving us our daily bread or meeting our needs. We're not 100% sure exactly how to say it in English. So that's the best kind of translation of it. All right. So look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. And for these, this will all be NRSV that I'm reading because I wrote them down ahead of time. What was it? Ephesians 1? Ephesians 3, verse 20. I don't know how people drink cold coffee. That's disgusting. You gotta put ice in. Oh. And make it really cold. No. I drink it ice coffee day. is yummy. Yeah. Uh, no, ice coffee is cold. And I put like flavor in it and a bunch of sugar. Yeah. Yeah, um, you get it, you get it made with cream and sugar and five squirts of caramel. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's unrecognizable as coffee. Yeah. So now you all know John's secret recipe. So go out and start your own Starbucks and make the John latte. Actually, that's the Kathy's large iced coffee with caramel, and she gets the swirl on the top. <laughs> all right. Go, Kathy. All right. So Ephesians 3.20. Nothing about coffee in here. Um, now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So Ephesians is written by Paul to the, to the churches in Ephesus, which is a town in Asia Minor somewhere around modern day Turkey. Um, when he's writing this, he's recalling the ideas of the Lord's Prayer. Okay? So he's praying to God and to Jesus, who by the power at work within us, the Holy Spirit, is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. And the idea is that with this, with the Lord's Prayer, you're asking for specific things, okay? You're asking for God's kingdom to come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But God is able to accomplish a lot more than just that, okay? A lot more than you can even think of when you're praying these things. Because it's not just you praying. The reason that the Lord's Prayer is a very good prayer for Christians is because no matter what version you're using, no matter what language you're using, okay, across millions of Christians worldwide, we're all at some point of the day or night praying some version of this prayer. The prayer of the church is universal, and it's across every language and ethnicity and breakdown, and it's, it's everywhere. Okay? So when you join your voice to that, you are joining the eternal prayer of the church that just goes on and on and on, no matter what. 
And that's an important thing because you finally find that connection to the community of saints, the people that you may not know in person, but who are your sisters and brothers throughout the world who care about you and who are always there praying in some place or some time. You know, that's a remarkable sense of interconnectivity. And it's something that gives me a lot of peace because it means that even on the times when I fall down and I'm not doing right and I can't say the words because I'm so upset or because things have come apart so badly. And believe me, I might be a pastor, but that crap still happens. Okay. Even when I get in those funks, there is somebody out there who's not and their prayer carries mine. So if you would turn to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16. Going on a tour of the New Testament tonight. This kind of reemphasizes what I just said. So 1 Thessalonians 5. Rejoice always. Or 5, verse 16. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So again, Paul, writing to the churches in Thessalonica, which is in Greece, Paul got around a lot. Um, and it's the same idea, the, the pray, pray without ceasing, okay? That doesn't mean you pray without ceasing all the time, because we can't. We have those moments when we can't, you know, there's not a person on this Zoom call or in this world who hasn't had a time when the last thing that they could manage to do was pray. It's just the reality of the world. So when Paul says pray without ceasing, he doesn't mean you should pray in every waking moment. He means that the church as a whole is praying without ceasing and that you're a part of it. Um, and of course, the give thanks in all circumstances. We're talking about the will of God again. Okay. You know, it doesn't matter what people throw at you or what they take from you or what they think about you. You know, believe me, the people who knew me in high school, who knew how I was and how much I got in trouble, they don't think very highly of the fact that I'm a pastor now. They think I'm probably some kind of heretic and, and leading people astray and everything. And, you know, because they knew me then, they don't know me now. It's okay. I give thanks. I give thanks for them. I give thanks for what I'm doing now. I give thanks for who I was because it made me a better person. Everything in life eventually builds you up if you're able to walk with God. All right, so the last one, the last Bible verse for tonight. This goes back to the Old Testament. So 1 Samuel 2, starting at verse 1. All right, so for those of you all who know me well enough now, you know that I get excited about the Old Testament because it's in Hebrew and I really like Hebrew. I don't know how that happened, but it, it, it happened. So um, there's always a lot more here that I can actually talk about because none of you want me to break down the Hebrew. So 1 Samuel 2, starting at verse 1. Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in my victory. There is no holy one like the Lord. Excuse me. No one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken but the feeble gird on strength. 
Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry are fat with spoil. The barren was born seven, or the barren has born seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might does one prevail. The Lord, his adversary, shall be scattered. The Most High will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. Hannah puts it better than I can, which is probably why her words are in the Bible and mine aren't. <laughs> Though I do have a book named after me. You should read it, Joshua. It's pretty good. Um, it's this constant reversal of fortunes. This is, this is the thing that we have our hope in. Okay. In this world, we are the meek, the lowly, you know, not always economically, but at least look down on, especially in today's society, okay? Christianity as a whole is looked down on by a lot of people now because they don't see how it meshes with scientific theory and all that. And we've talked about that before. I think there are ways to make it mesh, but that's, that's neither here nor there right now. People look down on it because we can't show them in hand proof that God is real and present at least none that they'll accept as verifiable fact because they don't want to what we hope for what we know will happen is that one day when the lord chooses to renew the world those situations will be reversed and there will be uplifting for us who have believed through all of the criticism and everything else and the others I don't know. I personally hope that the others have a chance to change their mind. That God, who is a loving God, and has showed that throughout all of eternity, will say, okay, here I am, one last chance, and then open the gates. I hope that's how it works out. I don't want to send anybody to hell. At the end of the day, it's a reversal of fortune and the promise that God will be there with us no matter what happens with the world. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Questions, comments, concerns, smart remarks. I agree that I hope that there's a last chance and what I always look at is, um, the Bible says, God is not willing that any should perish. And if God is not willing, then it doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, and we, we've talked about this before. I had classmates at seminary who think that hell doesn't exist. Um, I have a problem with that because it's, it's biblical. So, you know, saying something that's in the Bible doesn't exist. Probably <laughs> Probably not a great idea if you're a pastor. Um, but I understand where they're coming from. Their, their, their main thrust is that God is a God of love and has, I mean, you look at the history of Israel. No matter how many times they've strayed from God, God always proved faithful to Israel and ultimately proved faithful beyond all measure by sending Jesus. You know, we Christians forget sometimes that Jesus was sent to the Jews and we took Jesus' teachings and went forward with them, but the Jews are still God's people. And so, you know, God has always proved faithful to them and come back to them time and time again, as God should, because they're God's people. We are adopted into that through Jesus, but we're not Jewish. So um, I also had a professor who would tell us at one point that, he believed that one day all people would be sat down at 
some great ecumenical feast and that everyone would be forgiven for their sins. And I got kicked out of class for telling him that if I got seated next to Adolf Hitler, I was going to be very unhappy with the seating arrangements. <laughs> um, so uh, my badness didn't end in, in high school, evidently. <laughs> um, you know, I, I prefer to think that God is a God of love and God will give us a chance. You know, I, I have a hard time with the idea that God's just going to cast beloved creations into eternal torment. Um, even if they did do bad things. Unless they refuse to ask for forgiveness. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think ultimately there'll be a point where there's no return, you know? Right. Okay, but from a completely different viewpoint, at the end, when Satan is cast into the lake of fire for the thousand years peace, and could he not be talking about the sins that he created here on earth being cast away with him, not it, necessarily it, the people? It's possible. See, the problem with, with trying to figure out what's going to happen at the end based on Revelation is that a lot of people don't take it in its proper context. John says at the beginning of Revelation that this is a vision that he had. It was a divinely inspired vision, sure. But people don't understand that, that throughout the book, there's things happening that have already happened and that haven't happened yet and that might not happen and they're all happening at the same time and it's really confusing and really hard to figure out. You know, we'll, we'll have a part in our worship service on Sunday where in the book of Revelation, St. Michael defeats the devil and tosses the devil and his angels out of heaven. But we know from biblical history that that's not something that'll happen in Revelation or at the end of time. That's something that's already happened. That's why there is a devil and there are demons because St. Michael has already kicked them out. Right. So it's hard interpreting Revelation because we don't know exactly where to put all the pieces. You know, and to be honest with you, there's been people since the day after Jesus died saying the world was going to end and none of them have been right yet. One of them they will be lucky eventually. eventually. <laughs> you know? Well, no, and there was, a, there was a bulletin, there was a billboard in town down by 402 that used to have the exact date it was going to happen on. Yeah, there, there's a guy who's predicted the exact date like four times and had like this huge gathering where, where all the saints were going to be raptured from there and this whole thing. And somehow he keeps getting it wrong. And somehow each time he puts out a new date, more people show up. I, you think they would have learned by now, but I, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again, I guess. Well, I guess the best way to sum up revelation is, is it is written it's it's written with a lot of imagery in it so some of it has already happened some of it's yet to come yep so on and so forth and it's one of the one it's one of the books that has the most complex greek in it i mean it's like i you know we had to translate some of it in seminary and it was just it was the kind of thing that made you want to go drink <laughs> you, you spent so much time in your dictionary and everything trying to figure out what this word might mean in this context and, and how to bring it all together that you're just like, I, I don't know. I give up. So I'm glad there are people who are much smarter than me who are doing the work of translating because if it was left up to me, it'd be bad. It'd be pigeon English in Revelation. <laughs> What other thoughts, concerns? Why was Hannah saying that prayer? So that would have been after, um, that would have been her Thanksgiving prayer after Samuel was born. But before she sent him to Eli? Probably so, yeah. In other words, he was probably a new infant. Yeah. If you remember, 
when Hannah is first praying for a child, she's out there and they think she's drunk. Um, because mm -hmm. she's, she's on the, the porch of the temple swaying back and forth because she's praying so forcefully. And the priest thinks she's drunk. Can you repeat that? My internet connection went unstable. So I said that when Hannah is first praying, not this particular prayer, but when she's praying for a son or for a child and promising to give the child to the Lord, she's on the porch of the temple and she's swaying back and forth because she's praying so forcefully and the priest thinks she's drunk and try to chase her off. Ah, okay. I heard you that time. <laughs> So anytime you show up to the church and there's somebody outside swaying back and forth, don't chase them off. They might be praying. You know, talk to them first. <laughs> all right. So that's all I've got with this. What other questions do you have? Thoughts, concerns? I just have information. The church envelope showed up at my doorstep today so I'll bring those in Sunday Sandy very good thank you John it's a little late for me to ask you but did you remember to record this yes <laughs> you usually see when you're doing it and I didn't you didn't tonight well it's because they had started singing and I didn't want to be like oh by the way <laughs> so you recorded that too yeah oh well good All right. Any other thoughts? Going once, going twice. Alexis, do you want to say good night? Uh, uh, <laughs> night. Good night, Hannah House ladies. <laughs> we enjoyed your song. <laughs> Modern fashion trends have become very strange. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, Lexi. Good night, Lexi. <laughs> Good night, Rosie. Good night, Good night John boy. <laughs> Good night. Before everybody goes, why don't we close with a word of prayer? The Lord be with you. And Not also with, with you. you. Gracious and merciful God, we thank you for giving us these words to pray. We thank you for helping us to see the care that you have for us in our lives, no matter where we're at in our lives, and no matter how lost we feel. We ask that your presence be with us, that your will truly be done in this world, that you help us to continue on as your examples for this world, to see what the transformation your love can create. Help us to be lights for those who are lost. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 All right. Amen. Thank y'all. Thank you, Pastor. We're Hannah House ladies, on. thank y'all for joining us tonight. See you in two weeks. Yep. Y'all have a good night. Thank you. Right. Bye.